And welcome to a webinar hosted by the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox, or CCAST. My name is Carly Jewell. I am a conservation biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the At-Risk Species Coordinator for CCAST. And for anyone unfamiliar, CCAST is a platform that supports peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange and the co-production of decision support tools on key management challenges, such as introduced aquatic species. Uh, CCAST also supports different communities of practice, including the non-native aquatic species community of practice that we launched in May of 2020. And if anyone would like more information on CCAST or our other communities of practice, uh, feel free to contact myself, Christy, or Matt Graybaugh, and we'll drop those emails in the chat here momentarily. Thank you, Christy. And with that, I'm going to actually hand it over to Christy to talk a little bit more about today's webinar and introduce our guest speaker. Thank you, Carly. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Christy Miner. I am the coordinator for the Non-Native Aquatic Species Community of Practice here at CCAST. And webinars like today's are just one way that we facilitate peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange. And today we're very excited to host a presentation from Danita Weeks, who will talk about citizen science and bullfrog eradication in Western Colorado. Danita is an assistant professor at Colorado Mesa University. She's been involved in amphibian conservation efforts for nine years with a research focus on the amphibian fungal pathogen BD and the amphibian microbiome. Danita received her PhD from the University of Memphis, where she researched the use of biopesticides as a disease mitigation tool in the fight against BD. Since arriving in Western Colorado in 2018, Danita has mentored undergraduate researchers at CNU to complete eDNA, acoustic, visual, and disease surveys on native and invasive species. She is passionate about education and inclusion of the community in amphibian conservation through various outreach opportunities. She and her students have also worked with Colorado Parks and Wildlife to successfully reintroduce the endangered boreal toad to extirpated areas on the Grand Mesa National Forest. So just as a final reminder before turning it over to our presenter, um, if you have questions during the presentation, please just go ahead and enter them in the chat box and I will relay them to the speaker after the presentation. And with that, Danita, we are ready for you. All right. Um, so today I want to talk to you guys about the citizen science um, event that I've been putting on for the last two years, and it's called Bullfrogs for Beers. And I'm going to give you a little background about how we got there, but I thought um, kind of takes a small army to um, successfully eradicate bullfrogs from certain areas. And what better motivator than some free beer? Um, there are other prizes, though, for those that weren't interested in that. So just to give you an idea of where I'm at, so I'm in Grand Junction, Colorado, and we're on the western side of the state here. And if we look at this map on top, um, this area on the left called the MCNCA is the McKinnis Canyon National Conservation Area. And when I first arrived here, I started a collaborative agreement with Bureau of Land Management, CPW, USGS. We've all been working together to go into these canyons that are remote places, catalog the native amphibians that live there, and also see if bullfrogs have arrived. And um, to give you an idea, where the town is at. So over here you see that says Snooks and Autobahn. Those are two of the parks that we've sampled during our citizen science events. And then this area in general, this valley includes Grand Junction and a couple other small towns. And the bottom left is an image of what that McKinnis Canyon NCA looks like. So it's this very windy canyon area um, that uh, the Colorado River runs through. So um, this is another map of the same area, but maybe a little more helpful to give you an idea that this big area in gold, that is all the McKinnis Canyon NCA. And each one of these, now it's kind of faint to see, but we have these little canyons that run off the river that go to the, um, the south or the bottom part of the river there. So all of those canyons are these really remote environments and we didn't know much at all about the native species that live there. And this area is pretty heavily recreated with um, people who raft the rivers so people can camp along this area. 
And our priorities here in this McKinnis Canyon NCA research was, as I mentioned, cataloging diversity bullfrog presence and also any animals that were captured, we would swab them to see if they're carriers for um, BD, for that fungal pathogen. So over the last, since 2019, we've been doing this. Um, we've been going out and doing these surveys and it supported eight students who've gotten to do research through this. Um, we have um, created some maps of some of our results here and I'll give you an idea of kind of the, to get to these sites, we actually have to boat down river and then hike up these canyons. And the way we do our surveys, so for the native amphibians, we would do our call surveys at night and we would do captures at night, it's a lot easier, and we would do our swabs then, and also visual encounter surveys during the day and the night. And we would grab GPS points for any locations of the animals, and some of those locations are really difficult to get to, so here's a couple of photos of my students having to climb up waterfalls, um, so it's was, it was pretty uh, rigorous hiking. And the native amphibians that we have around here that we were looking for, in case um, you're not from this area or familiar with it, the Woodhouse's toad, uh, Great Basin Spadefoot, Red Spotted Toads, the Canyon Tree Frogs, and the Northern Leopard Frog. And so the Woodhouses and the Red Spotted, they're pretty common. We find them even in the valley um, around houses. But the Great Basin Spadefoot is one that's a little more cryptic, and the Canyon Tree Frog as well, and the Northern Leopard Frog. All three of those are of a pretty big concern for um, CPW and for BLM in the area. So we're trying to understand where they are and how their populations are doing. And then with our surveys, we were also looking for the presence of the bullfrog, as we know that they're invasive out here in the Western United States. We would do call surveys for them and visual encounter surveys, but um, probably the most helpful is we were doing eDNA collection. So in pools where we found water up in these canyons, we would collect our water samples and we would filter them in the field and send them off to USGS where they would analyze them for bullfrog DNA. And I'd like to point your attention to this kind of habitat in this middle picture. You can see that this is just a little collection of rainwater runoff and this habitat where we live, usually this is gonna dry up by mid to late June. So we do a lot of our sampling in the spring or in the early summer. And a lot of the habitat is very similar to this. And then the students would do all of the work in the lab, analyzing the swabs for BD fungus. Um, they would do all the DNA extractions and qPCR to see if that fungus was present. So to kind of reorient you, um, here is a map again showing the MCNCA. And I'll show in the next slide, this map will be bigger so we can see uh, what we've found so far. We're working on updating some new maps, but for, um, for the first couple of years of data collection, so we focus in each one of these colors is a different canyon that we sampled. And these color blocks over here in the legend represent the shorthand version of the uh, Latin name for each species. So I'll just go through a couple that are um, really important to point out. So this VES is just a visual encounter survey and LICA is the Lithobates catasbanus, so the bullfrog. So areas where we saw them, and then also eDNA, um, those samples that came back positive, that'll be in teal. So if we look on the map here, there's this one creek on, this, on the north side called East Salt Creek. That one, we definitely saw bullfrogs there and eDNA collection. And then there's one in beige toward the bottom called Me Canyon. This one, we found a bullfrog at the entryway, eDNA was positive, and perhaps more concerning, they also, um, that bullfrog there had BD. So it's carrying this fungus out to these remote locations. And our biggest concern with these kind of surveys was finding out where the native amphibians are and hopefully the bullfrogs had not made it up into those canyons where they can carry disease or perhaps eat our native species. And this year, I will tell you that everything changed. Um, for the last couple of years, we've found the bullfrogs were mostly by the river. So wherever the canyon mouth drains into the river, that seemed to be the only habitat that was supporting bullfrogs um, through both visual surveys and eDNA. But this last summer, we were hiking and we were two miles up into Me Canyon and we found bullfrogs. So this change, we're not sure why suddenly they're moving um, so much farther up into the canyon. 
but that's created a new kind of level of priority for eradication in some of these canyons. When we started this project, we wondered though, if there's not a lot of habitat that supports these bullfrogs out in the canyons because they do dry up midsummer, where are they coming from? And when we look at all of the little ponds that exist right along the river in the valley um, where Grand Junction is and some of the other smaller towns, they're loaded with bullfrogs. So these may be acting as these source populations. And my students and I in 2019 went ahead and sampled a few of them just to see if those bullfrogs were also carrying BD. And you'll see here on the map where there's this little frog stamp where there's fruta and there's this little plus sign here. So this area is a waterway called Snooks Bottom and we found BD positive bullfrogs here. And then this area in Grand Junction with the little plus sign stamp, that was an area called Connected Lakes. Um, we found a positive there. And then over in this far right area, uh, Riverbend Park and Palisade, we found lots of bullfrogs. Fortunately, none of them were BD positive. But it's possible that the Colorado River is acting as a corridor and washing some of these bullfrogs downstream into these remote canyons. So then came bullfrogs for beers. Um, I thought it's going to take a lot of manpower to try to remove these animals and see if they are carrying BD. Um, I need a lot more sampling effort. So I worked closely with Colorado Parks and Wildlife to create marketing materials for the event. We wanted to make sure that when we presented this to the public that we were very clear that the bullfrogs needed to be removed, why they were a problem, but also that the public and people who were volunteering knew what was going to happen to the bullfrogs because they would be euthanized. And we wanted to make sure that that wasn't misinterpreted in any way. Um, so we made sure to be extremely transparent and we had um, lots of um, back and forth making flyers to make sure that it, it went out the right way. Volunteers were recruited through advertisement. Um, we have a local map and science center where a lot of people already interested in conservation go. So um, I use their, um, their means of um, kind of recruiting people. Uh, we use Facebook and then we sent emails to other interested groups like the Audubon Society and Rivers Edge West which are just uh, local groups interested in animal conservation. And all the volunteers that signed up, they would send me an email if they wanted to be a part of this. They were required to do a training before they were allowed to come to these events. And that was something that CPW and I talked a lot about to make sure that um, everyone knew how to properly move about the habitat, what animals to collect, which ones not to collect, and that they understood the, the education piece of why we were doing this. So that Zoom training included introduction to the native species that we have here, um, the bullfrog issues that are presented in the Western United States, the rules for the collection days, and how those bullfrogs will be used. And then down here um, in the bottom are some of the groups that I've partnered with. So I already mentioned Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Rivers Edge West is a conservation, a local conservation organization, um, and they um, help donate some supplies. Colorado Partners for Amphibian and Reptile Conservation jumped on board and donated um, some money to help with supplies. And then the beer part was actually donated by this group called Base Camp Beer Works. They were very interested in the river conservation. And then Eureka, our math and science center. So the objectives for Bullfrogs for Beers was, I really wanted to educate the community and get them involved in the removal of the invasive species and understanding um, why they are an issue. And then also created research projects for undergraduate students in my lab at CMU, because those students were carrying out all the BD testing, and they've also been doing an analysis of the diet. And um, we're still working on kind of the big picture of the insect parts of the diet, but our priority was really finding out, are they eating vertebrates? Are they eating amphibians and snakes and lizards and fish? And then ideally, we wanted to donate the bullfrogs to a local high school for use in science labs so that instead of them having to buy bullfrogs from a, a vendor who buys them from a bullfrog farm, we were reusing them um, here locally. We're still navigating this objective. I've had some communication with local science teachers who are interested. We just haven't gotten these bullfrogs into the classroom yet. And just a couple examples of some of the training slides that I used. Um, I told all the individuals who were on the training that we were going to collect data about the bullfrogs in the park. We wanted to know how many males and females, what size are they, 
um, the disease status of those bullfrogs and those gut contents, what are they eating? And each, each volunteer was told to expect at the event that everyone would have to have completed that virtual training or they could not participate that day. They had to sign a liability waiver at check-in. And then we would do a walk over to the pond where I would discuss the area for sampling that we were to stay focused in. They would be given gloves and they were taught how to remove those gloves and to change them in between each animal so that when these animals were turned in, we could sample them for um, that disease. And they were told that when they capture a bullfrog, they bring them over to a uh, check-in table where I was with my research students and they would then process the bullfrogs there. But they were, um, they were told two bullfrogs equals one beer voucher. And some of them were so good at catching bullfrogs that I had to up the number of bullfrogs for one beer voucher I was running out. Um, but I also had different prizes for those that were under 21 or would prefer something else. Um, they were also taught how to recognize a bullfrog easily and that only bullfrogs were to be captured. Um, no gigging of frogs would be allowed. All, of those, all the frogs had to be submitted alive and unharmed to our data table. They were asked to hand capture with a glove and they were allowed to live capture um, with a net if they preferred and they could even bring nets from home if they wanted. I had some available. If they used a net, I did have buckets of bleach water and rinse water. So before they started their sampling and in between each animal, they would have to clean that net. <clears throat> um, no one attended children at the events. So I always had to have parents or supervising and um, I let them know that I had a scientific collection permit with CPW that specified I could do this and that they were covered under that permit. Um, but if they wanted to, following these events, remove bullfrogs on their own, they were allowed to with a valid fishing license. Um, so the valid fishing license, there's an unlimited capture number on bullfrogs in Colorado. And then of course I told them what we're, what we're going to be doing with the bullfrogs. Um, that they'll be carefully swabbed and measured at the park and that they'll be then transported to my lab and receive an overdose of fish anesthetic. I use MS-222 um, and I of course went over why um, they're invasive and damaging and once we actually collect them from the water per state regulations we cannot return them and um, explain that we want to know if they're eating native amphibians and stealing food from native amphibians and then let them know that some of those bullfrogs will be donated to the local high schools. So the local, uh, the collection locations that we chose, um, Snooks Bottom, the Connected Lakes, also called Autobahn. There are two parks that overlap there. And this year we added one more location called Corn Lake. And so I'll go through what we found at each one of those. Um, overall, for just the last two years, the events have been pretty small, but they've been very successful. Um, we've had partnerships develop with local conservation groups and businesses. So outside of just the beer donation vouchers, we've had a pizza place downtown that has now um, jumped on board. They donated uh, slices of pizza. And um, we also have a local uh, dairy, uh, locally owned dairy restaurant ice cream, sorry. Total number of volunteers who have participated are 81 and we've removed 91 bullfrogs. And this is a little setup of what I would have at the events. I have a table where we would have all the gloves, the swabbing materials. We would measure their snout to vent length, their mass and get all of that information. So the 2021 events, um, we had three training dates over Zoom. I tried to do some in-person ones, but people seemed to prefer Zoom. It gave them a little more flexibility on jumping onto a call and just um, doing their training that way. So we did um, one at that Connected Lakes area where we caught 27 bullfrogs. Um, for Snooks Bottom, we did one event where we caught 16 bullfrogs and another one at Snooks Bottom where we caught five more bullfrogs. And these, this picture on the far right, these are the nets that were actually donated by River's Edge West. Um, so they donated these live capture nets that were easier for little kids to use. And just an image here in the middle of some of the folks that came out to help capture. So um, a little more detail about each one of those locations. So um, each event, we were only allowed to have 12 volunteers. This was something that I worked out with Colorado Parks and Wildlife. This was to make sure that since I was the one supervising this event, that 12 volunteers is a pretty manageable number. But if we start getting um, into the 20 or more volunteers, 
um, you start trampling habitat perhaps, and it's a little harder for me to make sure that everything is going well. Um, so 12 volunteers maximum, and of the 27 bullfrogs that were caught that night, um, most of them were really small. We caught 24 juveniles, two large females, and one male. And on this map, to give you an idea of what it looks like, you can see the Colorado River running through here in the middle. And then this connected lakes, there's a bunch of uh, lakes here that all connect across the, the park and they're right near the river. And so the river, when it floods, actually makes connection with those, with those ponds. And the area we sampled specifically is one pond right here to the left of this Audubon Nature Preserve. We did not find any BD on the frogs that year. So that was good news. For Snook's Bottom, we did two different nights of collection with 12 volunteers both nights. And here we caught 21 bullfrogs. And interestingly, we didn't catch any juveniles like we did at the other place. We caught 14 females and seven males, all large breeding size. To give you an idea what that looks like from above on the map, you can see the Colorado River here. And on the left-hand side is that Snook's Bottom open space. It's a pretty big body of water. And we also did not find BD that year either. So 2022, um, we had three different locations. We did three training events again over Zoom, and we had um, we resampled Snooks Bottom. We found 10 bullfrogs that time. Uh, connected Lakes recollected 19 bullfrogs, and um, I actually had a Girl Scout troop reach out to me because one of the uh, the leaders came to an earlier collection event and thought that the girls would really like it. Um, so we did an event just specifically for them as well. And for the Girl Scout troop, we actually did our training on site because we thought maybe over Zoom would be a little difficult for everyone to kind of be excited and be engaged. So um, I brought uh, little educational packets with pictures to the, uh, the event for the Girl Scouts. So for the Snooks bottom results in, uh, for this past summer, we had the 12 volunteer who just did the one night of collection. We found 10 bullfrogs there. All of them were large adults. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't have the mass and SVL data up here yet, but we found three females and seven males. So similar to the previous year, we didn't find any juveniles at all. We are still working on the BD samples as well. For connected lakes, um, we found 19 bullfrogs this year and still the majority of them were juveniles. And these juveniles were, um, were very small with an average mass of 37 grams compared to these larger females and males. Um, two females and three males. BD samples are still pending. I have students working on those. And then the Girl Scout troop night, we actually had 21 volunteers when you start, when you counted for all the parents that did come with the girls. And this was a very large lake though, and they spread out. Um, and it didn't seem like too many to handle, given that these were parents that were just uh, going out with their kids. So we found 14 bullfrogs this night, six large females, four large males, and four juveniles. We're still working on the BD results for that one. But interestingly, we've gotten through some of the diet analysis. So for 2021, we have analyzed those bullfrogs, and we didn't find any vertebrates in the stomachs of of those from that collection year. But for this past summer, we have found three bullfrogs that um, have clearly eaten uh, local uh, vertebrate species. So this first one, um, this one was from the Connected Lakes location and we found a fish in their gut. I know this is hard to tell it's a fish. When you zoom in, there's little fish bones here um, and you kind of turn it over, you can tell it's fish skin. I couldn't identify what species and then um, also we have a woodhouse's toad, a juvenile woodhouse's toad that was in its stomach. And you can see in this photo that that bullfrog that ate it was not very large. And then <clears throat> this bottom one, frog number two, we figured out this was the pelvis of an anurin. We're still trying to figure out if it is a frog or a toad, um, trying to use a little bit of information about ratios with the bones, but we haven't nailed that down yet. We know that it is um, the pelvis though. And Corn Lake, so where the Girl Scout troop went to collect, we actually found um, that they'd eaten, that this particular bullfrog had eaten a juvenile garter snake. 
So um, this is really significant because we wanted more evidence that the bullfrogs are consuming native vertebrates. It's going to help support grant renewal for the grants that um, we're continuing to sample these canyon lands. And knowing that these are eating native species, it's going to help support that grant application and also the prioritization of eradication efforts, especially now that we know these bullfrogs have moved a couple miles up into some of those remote canyons. Um, so some of the challenges that I have faced um, are just with the funding part of it because I chose to make it a um, bullfrogs for beers. And even though um, it's, it's a pretty low cost thing to do, I've had lots of conservation organizations and local businesses are excited to help. And that Monumental Beer Works, um, they've changed their name recently. They donated beer vouchers for the first two years. So I haven't actually had to purchase the beer vouchers as of yet. The con is that most funding that people want to donate do not allow purchases of alcoholic beverages. So that is one challenge that I run into because that does seem to be a big motivator for people and something that they enjoy. Um, in future directions, um, I would like to include more locations and events. It seems like the community is really interested in this and they get excited by it. And I'd like to expand partnerships with other local businesses who wanna jump on board. Most other breweries locally have been interested in giving um, discounted beer vouchers so that um, I can have more variety with the uh, breweries as well. And um, the big dream is to involve river rafters. So as I mentioned, this area, um, this Black Ridge Canyons Wilderness or the MCNCA, this is a um, highly recreated area where there's campsites all along and it's commonly rafted. People camp along the shore a lot of the areas where the campsites fall are in areas where um, the habitat might support bullfrogs. So I ideally would like to get river rafters involved. It's a 24 mile stretch of river and then have some um, way of collecting when they exit the river so that I can analyze them there. All right, I'm open to take any questions you guys might have. Thanks, Danita. That was great presentation. Very interesting work. Um, yeah, so just real quick, we had one um, kind of question slash comment. Um, instead of a beer voucher, I wonder if you could use a local sporting goods store, maybe a $5 coupon or 10% off purchase. Uh, so kind of a suggestion there. That's a great idea. Um, I hadn't thought about a sporting goods store. I've been focusing on restaurants like ice cream places and pizza and, and the beer vouchers, but I wanted to expand to more variety of rewards. I think that'll be successful if I have more options and that'll be a great way for me to um, use money that's donated also. So that's a great idea. Cool. Um, okay, and then we've had a few questions. I'm gonna start from the top. Um, based on the rollout of your marketing materials, what were the general sentiments from the public about this? Everyone has been really supportive who has email, like reached out about it. Um, I did hear of a couple people like through my university who were excited about it until they realized that the bullfrogs would be euthanized and they just chose not to participate. Even though they understood the value in doing so, they, they didn't want to come out and collect and that is totally fine. Um, sometimes there was one, the Snooks Bottom Park, people commonly come out there um, during sunset for walking around the little trail and they would ask what we're doing and we would explain to them. And a few people were, you know, they didn't quite understand why we were doing it. Um, so we didn't get, you know, full support and uh, cheering on from everyone, but most people were just, if they were uncomfortable, they just didn't participate. Awesome. I think that's pretty good, pretty good outcome and the most you can ask for sometimes. Yeah. Awesome. Um, were there any considerations you had when using eDNA for detecting bullfrogs in the canyon lands? Were there any considerations that I had? Um, can I ask for more specific Yeah, Carly, was that a question from you? Yeah, I can chime in. It was for me. Um okay. And I guess just generally, like, why did you choose that method? Like, were you detect trying to detect a certain age class? Were you 
weighing the pros and cons of that versus visual surveys, like why eDNA as the tool of choice? That's a great question. Um, initially, my tool of choice is a visual encounter survey and call surveys because amphibians come out at night. Um, but we were thinking of, you know, in these canyons where we're sampling, we have to boat to these areas, we get one night to stay there and then we leave. This allowed us one more tool to be able to sample if they were there in the last 24 hours and we just happened to miss them. And um, it's something that was a big part of the, the cooperative agreement between CMU and the other agencies. Um, one of the things that it really helped with, when we're hiking up these canyons, they actually go up in elevation quite a bit. And so we would see these big rock waterfalls and we would assume a bullfrog can't climb very well. So we were trying to sample below and above these waterfalls to see if we found DNA in those spaces um, to give us a better idea of where they're moving in elevation as well. Yeah. Awesome. All right, next question. Do you have a sense of the total population numbers in the ponds, um, just to get a better idea of the number being removed and how, um, how that compares to the populations that exist? So we don't. Um, we've done call surveys. Um, I, and one of my colleagues has started trying to come out. We were doing surveys before and after the events to see if they made a big enough impact. But if we're collecting mostly females, that doesn't give us much. Or if we're collecting mostly juveniles, it doesn't really say a lot about how many males were removed because those are the only ones calling. We would like to start doing more rigorous surveys where we actually are getting in the water and going around identifying the number of individuals before and after an event. I think that's just the manpower at this point. We haven't gotten to that, uh, to that point. So in the future, we would really like to, to do more surveys on the population numbers to have a better idea. Yeah, and there was a, another question about plans to do any monitoring or measurements. So I think that answers that question as well. Initially, I was just excited to see if the community would be interested in this kind of a thing, and it was something that would take off. Yeah, definitely. That's great. Um, all right. Have you had success with volunteers continuing to collect independently? I've had a couple of families reach out to me to ask, you know, um, if they're going out fishing, if they catch any, they can bring them to me. I haven't actually had anyone turn any in, but I think I've had a couple of families who have um, removed them and maybe use them for food um, because they're allowed to do so with a fishing license. So just a couple of families have. Okay, awesome. Um, this is kind of another perception question. Um, any worries about people getting attached to the frogs, either animal welfare or people who may want them around for sports? Oh, um, for animal welfare reasons, I've had people ask if they could take it home as a pet and that is that is okay if they really want to, um, they're allowed to, but um, I haven't, haven't had anybody not want to turn the frog in. They're, um, everyone who's participated has been very uh, supportive of the, the efforts and why we're doing this. Um, as far as people wanting them around for sport, um, for gigging and frog like eating, I haven't had anyone mention that. I have had somebody from CPW mention that it would be fun if we just had a big frog leg fry with them, um, but maybe down the road. Yeah, definitely. Seems to be a pretty popular thing. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Um, okay, and the next question, sorry if I missed it, but how long have bullfrogs been known to occur within your targeted areas? For a very long time. Um, I've only been here since 2018, but I've found historical records um, dating, I'm trying to remember, um, I want to say dating back to the 60s, um, that they first started to document it and publish things about it. Um, but I don't, there isn't a lot of information about it, but they've been around for a while. And we've had, we've seen a decline in northern leopard frogs and in um, boreal toads, and it's been proposed that perhaps the bullfrog introduction and bringing BD with them may be responsible for that. Yeah, interesting. Um, all right, and then how did you decide on your locations? 
I picked those locations based on ease of access for my volunteers. So there are definitely locations that we could have gone to, but the, the bank would be too difficult to get into. I didn't want anybody to get injured. These are places that um, people frequent for recreation already. And so they're kind of familiar with them. And um, I had already been there with my students before. So knowing that there were bullfrogs present and that we had found BD there, I really wanted to target those ponds. Um, and finally, a big part that played into it was when I reached out to different, um, like one of them is a state park and one of them is a local like city park. And when I reached out to people about permission, certain ones would reply and be a lot more um, open to the idea. And some of them I think wanted um, a longer permitting process to get in there. And it's on the list. I'd like to get in those places eventually, but for the first couple of years, I went with whatever was easiest to, to work with and of interest. Awesome. Yeah, and maybe eventually you can kind of add if some of those other locations become interested. Yeah. I see the um, comment about uh, building on Clint's suggestion. Outdoorsy companies would be interested in donating vouchers and gift certificates. That's a really great idea. Um, I actually try to reach out to, um, to Coors because they're a Denver company and try to see if, you know, bullfrogs for beers, if they would jump on that, but, you know, no luck there. But I'll definitely try some outdoors companies. That's a great suggestion. Awesome. Yeah, especially since it's such a big recreational area. Yeah. Um, great. Lots of good questions coming in. Um, did you find any good techniques for remote decontamination? For contam decontamination there at the site, um, we would just have a couple of large buckets that would have uh, bleach water in it that I know kills BD and then the rinse water. But other than uh, just cleaning off the nets, the gloves were all given back to me and removed and everything. So aside from the nets, we didn't have any other decontamination um, things we needed to worry about. They were instructed, um, the volunteers were also instructed to wash their shoes when they got home. All right, next question. If someone is thinking of trying to roll out a similar citizen science effort, are there any key considerations you would share? Um, for example, timeline, tasks, partners, et cetera. I think your local parks and wildlife is the biggest uh, one because they're the ones that without their support, I wouldn't have been able to move forward with this. And they, they helped me a lot in making sure that the marketing part of it was appropriate because um, you know, if you approach it the wrong way and the public thinks you're doing something um, horrible with these animals, they're not going to be in support of this. And that's the last thing that we want because like CPW, for example, they're working on eradication of invasive fish species all the time. So they have a lot of practice with this. So that was um, the biggest supporter that I was happy to have. And as far as timelines, my first idea for this came up in February of 2021. And um, it was happening in July. So it took a few months, I think, to make sure that we got the flyers to look appropriate, got the collection permits um, to have everything that was necessary, and then cleared the locations we wanted to sample. So that took maybe like two to three months. But advertising, um, only a couple weeks of advertising. Was, and I got um, the full amount of volunteers for each event. Great, seems very efficient. Yeah. Um, so yeah, go ahead. Oh, um, it, if somebody wants to do something like this, I'm happy to share any materials. Um, I'm happy to share the, the training PowerPoint that I used if it's helpful and open to questions or anything. Awesome. Yeah, we just, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. We just got a comment from someone. I'd love to share your efforts with some colleagues here in Minnesota, I think. Um, besides sharing a link to this presentation, is there a report or a website I can share? Um, so maybe if you want to put a link to this presentation, or if you have other materials you can share, we can, you can put them in the chat here, or we can send them out to everyone who attended. Okay, um, 
I don't have a website up yet. I've been working on it. Um, and as soon as I do, I want a website up so that people who came out to help collect these bullfrogs can see the results of their efforts. Um, and so I don't, I don't have a report officially or a website yet, but those are coming. So the link to the presentation might be the best start. Well, yeah, maybe um, once you get that website up, it'd be great if you could send send a link to me and I can send it out to folks that is worthwhile to people. All right, and then um, do you have any idea why you were getting more juveniles in some ponds than others? That's a good question that I've talked to my colleagues a lot about. Um, and we were wondering if it was a recruitment thing. Um, the, the pond Snook's Bottom that had the large males and females, that one is just this kind of single isolated pond right next to the river. Um, and we would see these reproductive age ones there, but not many juveniles. And I don't know, there are fish in both ponds. So it's not that they're being eaten more in one pond or the other. But then the Connected Lakes one where we found mo the most juveniles, it's a system where there are probably six or seven different lakes or ponds connected. And I'm wondering if it's just where the juveniles are hanging out. Um, it's a distribution thing there. I'm not sure yet. And I hope to have an answer to that in the next couple of years. Great. Um, those are all the questions that came through the chat. Um, but we still have some time if folks think of more questions, put those in the chat, or I think at this point, feel free to um, unmute and ask any further questions or make any other comments. Okay, uh, not hearing anything. So um, that was a that was a great discussion, though. Um, so I think I will go ahead and close us out. Um, so thank you, everyone, uh, for taking the time to join us. As you know, the webinar was recorded, and we will make it available on our YouTube channel, uh, where you can also find all of our previous webinars. And Carly's going to put um, some links in the chat for everyone. We'll also have a link to our case study dashboard where we currently have 175 published case studies. Our next webinar is going to be fe February 16th. Uh, this one will be from Robin Reeder and Trevor Shuffles from Fish and Wildlife Service, who will be speaking about bullfrog removal on Convoy Lake National Wildlife Refuge. So if you aren't already on our mailing list and would like to receive those announcements, um, please just let us know and we'll get you on there. Uh, so thank you again all for your time and especially to you, Danita, um, for sharing this, this great project with us and giving this presentation. Um, and we hope to see you all again soon.